All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are the final. This is the final lecture of this week. Now, keep in mind, this has been a big week. It's a full chapter. So, friendly reminder. And I hope, I hope you heeded my warning about how long this would be if you did not start it over the weekend. So hopefully tonight you are not going to want to die because you're working on your outline for this week. So it's due tomorrow. Are we all done with our outlines? I can't, people. I can't. I can't. Now, I will tell you that it is worth 20 points, not 10 points. So it is worth twice the points for twice the effort. So it is worth it. If you are thinking it is not worth it for me to do it, cool. It's going to hurt your grade twice as bad. So that's how I get you. So please make sure that you are ready to go for tomorrow with your long outline. What? About how long do you need to be? Should be about four pages. Oh, two pages front and back. Yeah, it should be about that. Four pages. It's like, this should be, no, it should be like four pages front and back. Yeah. Four pages front and back, yeah. What? It's like two pages long as well. Okay. This is a question you're going to want to hear. Charles asked me, is this the longest one of the year? Yes, because there'll never be one that's two chapters. But there is a couple times that there is a couple uh, that's a full chapter. If you look on your scope and sequence, Charles, you will see exactly what weeks it's a full chapter. But none of them are 40 pages. No, I don't think that's true. I think there's one longer. Cool. It's awesome. We're going to get going here, though, because we have things to do. So, I literally hate all of you. In your own unique way, of course. Here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What stage of sleep are you emitting delta waves? What stage of sleep are you emitting delta waves? Corinne, stage four on your whiteboard. Please tell me, what does REM stand for? Oh, God, people. Some of the stuff you should just have done at this point. That's not good. What do you got, Sophia? Rapid eye movement on your whiteboard. Please tell me. Um, at stage three, what two waves am I emitting? What, Charles? Um, why would you say what, what stage three is in delta waves? Why is it four and three? Because it's only four. Because, like, I'm just asking you right now, what two sets of waves are you emitting? Oh. And the answer is what, Olivia? Uh, theta delta. Theta delta. So when it's just singular, it's only stage four. On your whiteboard, what type of brain waves are you emitting in REM? Good. What is it, Alexis? Beta. Beta. On your whiteboard, please tell me what type of brain waves are you emitting right now? Good. What is it, Corinne? Beta. Beta. Who can raise their hand and explain to me why REM sleep is called the paradoxical sleep? Why is REM called the paradoxical sleep? Annie? Because it's like the deepest stage of sleep, yet your brain sleep is active as a human being. Beautifully said, Annie. Okay, it's called the paradoxical sleep because in your deepest stage of sleep, your brain is the most active. You need to be familiar with that term. It's going to be on the AP exam. I guarantee it. On your whiteboard, your circadian rhythm is managed by what part of your brain that regulates your mood, your hunger, all of that stuff. Good. Kate? Hypothalamus. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is it called when you have any significant loss? Uh, the impact of this is loss. Nope. <laughs> I'm skipping that one. It was. It just wasn't coming out eloquently. Please tell me what sleep theory believes that sleep is for the necessary of repairing your body and replenishing your mind. What sleep theory believes it is all about replenishing the mind. Good. Come on. I got three. 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 What is it, Charles? Restorative theory. Restorative theory. What machine measures our brain waves? Good. What is it, Sophia? EEG. On your whiteboard, please tell me. Uh, stages one, two, three, and four also have another nickname. What's that nickname? Good. Emerson. 
Non-REM. Perfect. On your whiteboard, please tell me. At stage two, what type of brain waves am I emitting? No, that's one. Nope. Good. What is it? Nina. Sleep spindles. Those are the actual waves. Yeah. I thought that was like the Yeah, because they're like, they are jolts, and that's why they're called sleep spindles. So it's like, there's like another there is, but that's all you need for AP, so I only care about that one. I, ladies and gentlemen, I only know what I need to know, and that is about it, which I will explain to you in which we've come across things when I said I don't know anything else because I only know what I need to know. On your whiteboard, what is the fancy term for sleepwalking? Good. Uh, what do we got, Kaylee? Symbolism on your whiteboard. What is it called when you have a dream with a plot line that scares you? Good. That, that handwriting is horrible and would create these, Hayden. What is that? Nightmare. Nightmare. <laughs> on your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called when something scares you but has no plot line, like falling or death? What is it, Caroline? Night terrors. On your whiteboard, what is it called when you cannot get to sleep, stay asleep, or get a good quality of sleep? It requires diagnosis and medication. Jaden, what is Rusty, the most adorable dog in the history of dogs? My man is just running, 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 having a great day, and then just falls asleep. Now, he's adorable, but we can all agree this disorder would not be fun to have. What is it, Bella? Not Bella. Maggie. Narcolepsy. I'm so sorry. I have a Bella who said their last period. I'm so sorry, my darling. Narcolepsy. On your whiteboard. Freud believes the content of my dream of a dog chasing me through a forest is called what? Good. What is it, Alexis? According to Freud, a dog chasing me through a forest is a symbol of my youth escaping me and how I'm becoming a decrepit, old, bitter old woman. What is it, Olivia? Blatant. All right. Oh, I'm so glad I don't have to teach that shit. Let's begin, shall we? Okay, so yesterday we did start talking about psychoactive drugs, correct? Yeah. Okay, so yesterday we talked about physical dependence, tolerance versus withdrawal. The more you take a drug, the higher tolerance gets, so it requires more of a hit to get that alcohol. So after your first beer on your 31st birthday, one beer will get you drunk. 31st. 31st. Of course, you're not going to go on, you're not going to be tacky on your 21st birthday. You you're not going to be tacky on your 21st. You're going to wait till your 31st birthday, right? <laughs> anyway, moving on. Okay, withdrawal is the symptoms of it escaping your body. It's incredibly painful, which is why people form a physical dependence. They don't want to, uh, they don't want to have that feeling. Did we get to physical dependence? Yeah. We did? Yeah. Okay, so the feeling that the drug is needed to continue to feel an emotional or psychological well-being. We talked about this yesterday, how I have a psychological dependence to wine at public events, right? I feel like I need it in order to be social. I'm not really drinking it because, you know, I don't really drink that much. But I need to have it in my hand, and it gives me something to talk about and distract myself. That's the only way I can be social. We got to stimulants yesterday. Stimulants are drugs that increase the functioning. We talked about amphetamines. We talked about cocaine. Yes? Okay. Huh? Okay, so with stimulants, stimulants are going to over-excite your neural system, your neural pathways, your nerve system. So everywhere, like if you take too much cocaine, okay, what's going to happen is your body is going to lose sensations throughout it. Because what happens is, is cocaine and other stimulants increase the functioning of your nervous system. So it responds faster, which makes people feel invincible. With that being said, it dulls out your nervous system, so eventually you lose control. If you take too much cocaine, like Charlie Murphy, uh, it's a Chappelle show thing. Anyway, no, you, I'm too old. Anyway, if people who take too much cocaine 
like uh, a couple like rock stars and stuff, they literally shake. It's because their nervous system has uh, permanently been damaged from it. Yeah, that's why people who shake typically, unless they have like a specific disorder, if they've used drugs, it's simply because they abuse cocaine. Stimulants. Another one is nicotine. But you all know about that, you little vapors. <laughs> Disgusting. If you people are still vaping at this point when people are just dying and literally their lungs are collapsing, what the hell is wrong with you? Just go buy cigarettes like every other generation. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Do not buy. I can't believe you, your generation. We almost got it gone, people. We almost killed the tobacco industry. Okay? We, my generation, we said no and got caught up in other stupid crap, but we still said no to tobacco. It's your generation who brought it back. You can't possibly be proud. You weirdos. Ew, Emerson. I don't want you talking about Emerson. Caffeine. Caffeine is also a stimulant. Okay? It is the most common drug in the world, okay, under stimulants you need to have cocaine, nicotine, amphetamines, and all that stuff, you need to be able to identify them. Uh, cocaine, co <laughs> caffeine is the most popular stimulant in the world. Is anyone here addicted to caffeine? Like, you just can't start your day without it? Okay, that means a normal addiction. Okay, I don't have that addiction. I broke it, uh, but a lot of people do. By the way, this is how much caffeine is in things. Wait, it's, the most addictive it's the most commonly, most common. most common addiction is to caffeine. Yeah, like this is how much caffeine in milligrams things are. It doesn't even get into some of your like super crazy stuff. So look how healthy you are. <laughs> By the way, my husband, like I already told you his order. He drinks a venti a twice a day with a Trent iced coffee with two shots of espresso. That's Disgusting. Depressants, by the way. Depressants are drugs that decrease the functioning of your nervous system. These slow your body's ability to function. By the way, this is on your focus, and you're supposed to be writing the drug categories down on the back of your focus. So we have stimulants, depressants, and narcotics for those? Yes. Right? Yep. So you can be writing it on your focus as well. So, depressants are drugs that slow your body down. Barbiturates are, uh, are typically referred to as the pill form of depressants. They are sedatives. They slow you down. Um, an example of a barbiturate would be quaaludes. Have you seen Wolf of Wall Street? No. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Olivia just made the connection right there. Quaaludes are barbiturate. Quaaludes no longer exist. Um, the patent is gone and there's no more, at least no one, I, I don't know anyone who has them and they're very hard to find. Um, quaaludes are barbiturate. If you've seen the Wolf of Wall Street, he literally slows down in his functioning taking them, okay? Which is comical, but how comical is that in your real life? Yeah, no. We've all seen the scene where he's trying to drive the Lambo from... <laughs> you've never seen it? It's worth a watch. It's, it's worth a parents. watch. Not with your parents. That was also... <laughs> they say the F... Uh, they curse the F word more times than any other movie in the history of movies. Fun fact. Okay. Uh, benzodiapines are drugs that lower anxiety and reduce stress. You probably know someone who is on these. Anyone who has an anxiety disorder is on them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to the doctor and you're prescribed... Uh, any of these drugs, is there anything wrong with that? No. If you know your best friend is prescribed these medica medicines and these medications, and then you take your best friend's medications, is that a problem? Yeah. Yes. That is a huge problem, and you can die. So let's not do that either, playing high school. So, not that you would. Alcohol is also a depressant. And before you're like, but why do people go out and party and to drink alcohol if it slows you down? Because people are complex. And it slows down your mental abilities before it slows down your physical abilities. So when you're on your 21st birthday, you will feel intellectually looser, more sociable, more engaged in the conversation, and less concerned about your own 
like world and vortex, which is why people enjoy alcohol. Because it makes you less paranoid about your own behavior, how you look, how you speak, and all that stuff. However, eventually, if you drink enough of it, and on your 21st birthday we'll find out for the first time, you will find out that the physical components of alcohol will catch up to you real quick. And you will see people who are having a conversation and then just turn off. Okay? That is why alcohol is a depressant and it just slows you down. Now, at first it's a mental component and then eventually it will be a physical component. What do you got? Um, like, you know how, like... Well, you got a friend? You got a friend who's experienced mm -hmm. this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, some people, like, get, like, I don't know, like, happy drunk or sad drunk. Yes. Does it have anything to do with, like, your nervous system and how, like, alcohol affects, like, individually? It depends on a couple of things. It depends on the emotional state of the person who starts drinking, let's be honest. If you had a great day, you're going to have a better night, yes? Yeah. If you had a shit day, things are going to spiral real quick. So, second thing is that it, there is a little bit of a heredity to it. If you have a higher tolerance for alcohol, okay, you're going to do better drinking alcohol than people who have a lower tolerance of alcohol, and then it's going to spiral pretty quickly. So, it's about tolerance. It's about heredity. Like, I'm from a family of drinkers, my parents drank every single night. I grew up drink, being around alcohol. It was never a thing for my parents. I historically used to drink nothing crazy. Okay, I'm still Samantha Bennett. Let's not get wild. But I used to drink, like, in college. I had a normal experience in college, just like um, you probably have. Nothing crazy, just normal. With that being said, I have a higher tolerance than most people do, even though I don't really drink anymore because of my heredity, my family. Um, besides the fact I don't weigh five pounds, <laughs> the more weight you have, the better you are maintaining your alcohol. So if you don't eat much beforehand, all of those have an effect on it. So you have to take all those factors into consideration. What do you got? Um, why if you drink alcohol and like take a pill, you do not? Uh, because you're mixing two different things. One's typically an upper, the other one's a downer, and your in, uh, nervous system and your autonomic system completely crash. Does your brain just like turn off? Yes. Yes, it's absolutely horrific. Do not mix things, people. Do not be taking. The worst thing, like the scariest thing you can possibly do is start taking medications, like prescribed medications. Prescribed medications are higher potency than most illegal drugs because they're regulated by doctors. By taking medication that you don't know what exactly it is or someone's saying, oh, I think it's this, you're a complete moron. And you are literally hurting your brain chemistry, which means you will never feel quite the same way as you did before you take it. That's what happens when you take drugs, especially the higher uh, dose ones and the crazier ones. Alcohol, I'm not going to lie to you. You can drink alcohol and your brain chemistry is not going to change that much. Now, if you binge drink every single day or go really hard multiple times and you're going to start changing your brain chemistry that makes sense correct but if you recreationally drink alcohol it is fine you're going to be fine you're going to feel like yourself pretty shitty the next morning but eventually you'll feel like yourself again okay alcohol is fine messing with prescription drugs will change your brain chemistry because that's what it's designed to do that's what it's designed to do so if you're mixing prescription drugs, you're mixing the chemicals in your brain and you risk A, killing yourself right off the bat because, hello, you people are morons for be taking prescription drugs you don't know where they're coming from in the first place. Second of all, how do you know which drugs work well together? You can easily kill yourself. Do not be doing it. Okay, I'm getting off my soapbox now. Okay. Narcotics is your next category. <laughs> okay, narcotics are opium related drugs. Okay, opium is a plant. If you've ever seen American Gangster with Denzel Washington, if you haven't seen it, it's an amazing movie. So good. Um, it's all about uh, making heroin and cocaine, which are all narcotic drugs. They make it in Vietnam and then they use U.S. military planes to export it back to the United States, which is pretty genius. It's, pretty, it's a great movie, and it's based on real life, of course, uh, because why wouldn't the U.S. government be importing more drugs than any other cartel? It's fine. It's hilarious. It's a good movie. Moving forward beyond that, though, narcotics. <laughs> narcotics are based on opium. Opium is what poppy seeds come from. You know how they say don't eat poppy seeds before you take a drug test? 
is because poppy seeds are related to opium. Poppy plants are related to opium, which is why in The Wizard of Oz, when they walk through the poppy field, they all get high and they're all like, ah, it's time for a nap. And they all fall asleep. It's because they got high off opium. <laughs> you didn't know? No. You just think they got tired in the middle of this field? Yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. You probably think the sound of music doesn't have Nazis in it, people. <laughs> what? What, the Nazis dancing around? I know, the handsome guy is a Nazi, man. That's what it teaches you. Handsome men turn to Nazis. That's what we learned. It's Sound of Music, man. You are 16. He turns into a Nazi. I know that. He betrays the family, man. He does, but then he turns to the Nazis. Watch the movie again, you'll see eyes wide open. He was not taking advantage. He full willingly knew, and he turned over the Von Trapp family, including his girl. He didn't turn over the Von Trapp. Death. Trapp. Yes, he did. He blows no. his whistle in the cer- in the cemetery. No, but oh, the yeah. guy, you know, oh, yeah, the, house, the house guy or the butler or whatever was really the one that turned them over. <laughs> I just can't. Narcotics. I want to talk opium now, not sound of music. Opium is derived from poppies directly, and that is the strongest of the drugs. Opium is going to cause, of course, the opium war, historically. That's how the British get into China. It is also a drug. It's kind of, it's not kind of, okay. Opium is a drug that once you take it, you literally don't do anything. It's not like you take opium and you go party. You take opium and melt into a couch. And you just sit there and go, Ugh. okay, that's opium. Um, opium is literally you ingest, inject it into you and you just sit there and you just go, you just giggle. Um, it's super highly, highly addictive. If you start taking opium, you're probably going to die within about a year of taking it because every time you take opium, what do you need more of the next time? Opium. And then eventually your heart and your brain won't be able to take it and they just die. So, uh, yeah. Opium is not very popular. (laughs) Opium is not a casual drug we have here in the United States uh, because of the addiction rates. Uh, Drug dealers don't really have a market for it, so good for us, America. Uh, It is a big problem in the Middle East, and it also is a big problem in China still. People are constantly dying of opium in opium dens. It's like a real thing. You go, and like your drug dealer's in a spa, and you just lie on a couch, and like you get high, and then like you die there eventually. Morphine! Morphine. Now, anyone here in the room has taken morphine. Morphine is can be distributed by doctors, which is how you should be taking morphine if you've taken it. Morphine is an opium-based product. It is a derivative of opium. If you've ever taken it, Alexis has, I have, you are high as a kite. I was sitting in the hospital. Um, I had I had a rupture and I was in incredible pain. I got rushed to the hospital and they shot me up with uh, morphine. And then within seven minutes, I'm literally giggling, counting the clouds in my room. <laughs> yeah, there was clouds. There wasn't. <laughs> I was just like, oh, look at them. And my husband literally is one of his favorite memories. Do you remember when you were high and you were counting clouds? And that's his favorite memory. And um, so the high is great. Counting clouds, giggling, totally forgot my pain. Uh, And I was just like giggling and gleeful and all that stuff. And then the morphine wore off. And I vomited for like three hours in a row. And I had the worst migraine I've ever had. And I get terrible migraines. And it was horrible horrible and I was using it under doctor supervision so was I abusing it nope and it felt like shit Alexis would you say you had a similar experience yes okay when you're typically in a lot of pain they shoot you up with morphine on the battlefield our soldiers are still being shot up with morphine because when it hits it gets you super high really really quickly and that's why people like it the problem is is that the crash the withdrawal is super super sharp so with it even though i was under doctor supervision i could understand why people are like i just shoot me up with a little more morphine so i can avoid this okay and i was under obviously doctor supervision with opium drugs the fall the withdrawal is so severe that people never want to come down from it 
because it hurt so bad. Alexis agreed with me. We were both under doctor supervision. She was in pain for something, which is why they gave it to her. And that coming off of it is so awful. So imagine what happens if there was no pain that you had and you were just taking it. Which means your brain chemistry and all those endorphins you've released have just moved your brain chemistry so much that you won't be able to have those normal sensations again. That's what the, the taking opium does. Opium literally changes your brain chemistry. The specific dosages for morphine that are given by doctors are based on your weight the moment you walk in and they're calculating how much you weigh and how intense the pain is to figure out how to not mess with your brain chemistry. Yet it still sucks, doesn't it, Alexis? That is how severe morphine is. Morphine is becoming more and more abused here in the United States, so lucky us, Kaylee. So it's not typically morphine, it's typically oxycotton, which is like seven a hundred times the strength of morphine. Yeah, yeah, so those are, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. When you deal with painkillers, ladies and gentlemen, these are the pain medication, the opioid uh, crisis, which you're hearing. Opioids are opium. So the morphine is one of the easiest byproducts to make of opium. When you talk about oxycodone, which is one of the major opioids people are abusing, it's about a 50 or 100 times stronger than opium. So the side effects me and my girl Alexis had from taking opium under doctor supervision, multiply that times 100. Okay? So when you're getting doctor prescriptions and stuff like that, as we know through the opioid crisis, Okay? Doctors are not necessarily following the best rules. If you get prescribed really heavy morphine, you should maybe ask for something else because people are getting addicted to it. You probably know someone in your life who is addicted to it. Whether you know that outright, you have been exposed to someone, whether in your family or not. There is someone in your life, whether you know or not, has been touched by the opioid. Okay? And it is really, really scary. I, my husband and I refuse to take painkillers even when we get them prescribed. Even like the low-level ones. We're like super crazy. Like we're not going to get addicted to this. And they're like, no, you idiot. It's Tylenol. And I was like, cool. Cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> heroin. Now, ladies and gen uh, gentlemen, heroin is growing in popularity. Heroin has grown leaps and bounds in the last five years here in the United States. You want to know Why? Because they can't, people who get addicted to opioids like Oxycontin and the other really crazy high expensive drugs because the U.S. government has cracked down because of the opioid scandal, right, crisis, heroin is now a cheaper alternative. Heroin is only about 25% stronger than morphine. Okay, so people are now getting addicted to heroin. Heroin is a hell of a drug. You, sm you can either smoke it or you can inject it. What happens is, apparently, obviously, you heard how much of a sissy I am with morphine. Apparently with uh, heroin, when you shoot it, which is typically the most common way, smoking it apparently um, is not as an effective way to get into your system. Obviously, injecting it is the fastest. You inject it into your skin, into your veins, and within a ma about a minute, you feel like your skin is just dancing with rainbows. And it's just like pulsating with this beauty, and you're just like, ah. And you like can feel like the smile from like the depths of your soul, and you're just like, ah. And it's just like pouring out of you joy. And you're just like, ah. And you just literally sit on your couch or wherever you are in your bed and just go, ah. And you're like that for like six hours. And you're just like as high as you possibly can be and as happy and as joyful and every like sensation if someone just like smacks you on the head just feels like an explosion of happy. And it's like, ah. And you can't move. You can't do anything. You're just like, ah. You're just like weighted down with happiness. And then the withdrawal happens. Now, for heroin has the highest and sharpest fall. So, you're never going to get as high as you do the first time you take heroin, and you're never going to fall as quickly as you do off of heroin. So, your brain gets shot up with every single, um, every single of your neurotransmitters that give you any joy, your serotonin, your dopamine, and your 
adrenaline are all released into your brain at the same time. And it's just like an assault on your brain. Then what happens is you wear out your receivers. They literally attach to your brain molecules and just literally sit there and go, like, yeah. And that's why you get as high as you possibly do off heroin. Okay? When the withdrawal happens, your brain cannot pick up any serotonin, dopamine, or adrenaline. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have serotonin, you're depressed. If you don't have dopamine, there is no expression or connection to joy. You cannot feel happiness at any component. If you don't have, if you can, if your brain cannot process uh, and, uh, endorphins, then you don't feel rush at all. You literally just feel like you're a piece of toast. Like you're just fried on the outside and nothing is happening on the inside. When you come off of heroin, it is like apparently a freight truck. You go from this high of high into this complete hole of an experience. You can't really hear things as well. You can't really see things as well. And you don't feel anything. Like people can literally touch you and you can't feel it. You literally feel nothing, hear nothing, and experience nothing. Because your brain, you just literally fried it. So think about the next step. So if you feel nothing, right? The only thing that you have felt lately has been heroin. What are you going to do real soon? Heroin. Now keep in mind, if you take a half a tablespoon of heroin the first time, how is a half a tablespoon going to feel the second time? It's not going to be that good. So you have to take a full tablespoon to even get it registered. Because anytime you take a drug, okay, it is always going to be chasing the first high. It doesn't matter if you're marijuana, it doesn't matter if it's cocaine, it doesn't matter, whatever, you're always chasing the first high. Because the first time your brain is exposed to chemicals is the sharpest it's going to respond to those chemicals. So if you are taking like hardcore drugs like cocaine, heroin, for instance, okay, your brain chemistry will be altered. And you won't be able to feel normal comparisons to feelings because your brain can't register it anymore. So people who take heroin typically die within six months of starting it. Would you want to live in a world where you can't feel, see, hear things, everything's different, and there's no joy in your life? No. So you're going you're gonna to get strung out and you're just going to hang, like, you're going to die overdose. Can you feel like that forever? Yes. People who are, there's very few heroin uh, recovering addicts. No, you, you just messed up your... Hi, sweetie, you only have one brain. There's only one brain, sweetie. When you just shoot up your brain with all these chemicals and all this stuff, like, that's it. Like, people who use heroin, there's very few heroin recover... Like, like people who've recovered from heroin. You die, people, because your brain will never function the same way ever again. What do you got, Kate? Yeah, because they were willing to sell incredibly high amounts. Because there's literally... Guys, if you can't be you, you can't feel you, you can't think like you, do you really want to live? No. Imagine if you take a drug that changes you and you are the shell of who you are. Do you really want to live? No. So you're going to take as much as that drug in order to try to feel like you again, and then eventually that is going to kill you. It's really scary. It is really scary. Hopefully you see there's a difference between how I described alcohol and how I'm describing these hardcore drugs. Can we agree? Yes. Alcohol is something you should enjoy when you are 21, of course. It is something that you should participate. You can participate. You not should. You can partake, partake in recreationally. Go out, have a nice bottle of wine with your girls. Whatever makes you happy. Okay? But then when we talk about other drugs, you shouldn't be messing with prescription drugs because you have no idea what the hell you're taking. Cocaine is a terrible, horrible drug. Okay? It's also going to change your brain chemistry. However, do you see the difference in my explanation of cocaine in comparison to heroin? Yes. yes. Okay? Opiates and narcotics are no joke. 
Okay, cocaine is also awful. So don't walk out of here and be like, damn, well, Bennett kind of sold me on to cocaine. Like, that sounds like a good time. Like, I should really check that. That's not what I'm doing, but I'm going to keep it real and keep it honest for you, correct? Okay, <laughs> cocaine will have an impact on your life. Cocaine is not good for you. You are going to literally feel less. Okay, you will feel less, and people who take cocaine have less of a sex drive, and sex never feels the same ever again. Okay? That's what happens as a side effect, a side effect of cocaine. You lose sensation everywhere throughout your body because you've sent so many chemicals throughout your nervous system. Okay? When you talk about heroin, heroin completely changes your brain chemistry and you'd practically rather die than not feel anything again, which is why people don't recover from heroin. Pretty crazy. Just a typical Tuesday conversation. Hallucinogen! Hallucinogens. These are drugs, and for some reason they put marijuana in this category. Marijuana is kind of floating in its own category most of the time, and I believe it should be in its own category because it's not like most other drugs. Okay. They, uh, psychogenic drugs are going to increase feelings of relaxation and intoxication as well as with hallucinogens. Now, when we talk about hallucinogens, these create false sensory information. Okay. So... The most famous is LSD. This is on your category. It's also on the front of your study guide, by the way. LSD is the most famous one. LSD has lost favor in the public, uh, in your drug dealer repertoire. However, it's coming back. So, woohoo. Um, people who take LSD, there's an interesting fact about LSD. If you take LSD, it never disappears in your body. Like, it never disappears. It just gets broken down into your body and then stores itself in your back. It stores itself in your spine. And there's this amazing story of a guy who got into a car accident in, like, Massachusetts or New York or something. And when the police got to the, like, like fender bender, the guy was high as hell on LSD. And they arrested him for driving under the influence of LSD, which, by the way, if you are on LSD, you wouldn't be driving. Like, okay, like... No one takes LSD and is like, ah, let's go to the store. Okay? Anyway, he was high as a kite on LSD when he got arrested. They brought him to, like, the police station. He ended up coming off of his high of LSD. They tested him. They found it was LSD. The man hasn't taken LSD since he was in his 20s in college. He was now a 45-year-old man. The car accident cracked his back where the LSD was being stored in his back, which released the LSD into his system. So by the time the police arrived, he was high off LSD that he took almost 20 years prior. Yeah, it still had an effect. It's not obviously as potent as the first time he took it, but it still is pretty potent. He was still high. He still got arrested for a DUI. However, they did not charge him for a DUI because it was after the fact. You need, is it the end of the bell? Yeah. You need to know ecstasy or MDMA is also going to create hallucinatory, uh, hallucinatory effects. Okay. Uh, that's the reason why people go to, people go to the club and take uh, ecstasy. It's because all the lights get blurred, all the music, you like, you can see the music, man, and all that stuff. Okay, <coughs> idiots. By the way, it depletes your body of resources, and um, let's be honest, people who take ecstasy are not normal people, because it depletes your ability of serotonin, which is your movement. So people who take ecstasy uh, end up not being able to move as efficiently and as normal as usual. Fun fact. Yes. Yeah, so eighth period is so far behind. Do you at least find it interesting? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. See ya.